Hello and welcome to the Michigan Online Visionary Educators webinar on the discipline of breaks. My name is Dr. Ahmed Lasheb, and I'm a learning experience designer at the Center for Academic Innovation, where we are designing the future of learning through research, innovation, experimentation, and iteration. The Michigan Online Visionary Educator Series, MOVE for short, is hosted by the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan. An important part of our mission is to create a more inclusive and a global learning community. We believe that an informed, peaceful, and equitable society is dependent on learners everywhere adopting a learning lifestyle. This monthly series features experts sharing insights, tools, and discussions on issues relevant to the lives of people around the world. Many of the speakers may be familiar to you as they are the faculty behind some of our most successful and innovative learning experiences available through Michigan Online. For information on our upcoming MOVE series event, please be sure to check out the schedule at online.umich.edu forward slash MOVE. We invite you to submit questions for our speaker in the Q&A section, as well as upvote the questions that are most interesting to you. Our speaker will do his best to answer as many as he can. Our event will be recorded and will be made available on Michigan Online. Today, I'm joined by Professor Patrick Berry of the Law School to talk about the discipline of breaks. Professor Berry, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm gonna share my slides now. And as Ahmed said, we're gonna be talking about the discipline of breaks. And one of the things I love about these types of events is how global they are. This is a little word cloud, um, Eric from the marketing team here at University of Michigan, uh, Eric Joyce, made from a previous uh, talk we did. And you can see just the collection of countries and places that are on here. And so, to help me out today, I've actually recruited a wonderfully international uh, pair of panelists. So one is Alex Van Doren. So in addition to getting a JD here at the University of Michigan Law School, she already also has a PhD in comparative literature. So she speaks Spanish, she speaks Polish, she speaks German, She's also the mother of two adorable kids. So she speaks toddler. Uh, when we open up the chat, chat, feel free to use any of those languages. Spanish, I know we had Anna um, from Spain jump in on the chat already. If anybody's from Poland or speaks German, or if you have toddlers at home, feel free to put that in the chat. We also have Isha. So Isha is a law student here and she speaks Urdu. So if you have a question in Urdu, Isha will potentially be able to translate it for me. Some of you who have taken the Good With Hurts course may actually have corresponded with Isha. She's the one who runs our edit our edits uh, part of the courses. We acknowledge that we're creating material all the time and sometimes we make mistakes and many of you who are taking the course have been able to spot those mistakes or come up with new ideas. So if you've taken the Good With Words writing and editing, maybe you've corresponded with Isha or the speaking and presenting. And so they're gonna help me today, but first I wanna get a sense of the global audience. So if you could open up the chat and we'll have Trevor um, uh, open up the chat and I just put in where you're from. So we have Vinny says to the host and the panelists, I'm from Canada. I know there's some people who said from Novi, we got Stockholm, Athens, Minnesota, Baltimore, Kiev, another Minnesota, Germany, South Africa, Puerto Rico, wonderful, that's wonderful. Uh, my partner is actually from Puerto Rico. Uh, Philippines, uh, Bangladesh, Washington DC, Urbana, Slovenia, Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor. This is really, really fantastic. So. Uh, another thing that I like about this is we continue to get people in Nicaragua, Livonia, Athens, 
is many people have a connection to the University of Michigan, maybe even the law school here. So uh, now with the chat, uh, put in uh, if you have any connection to Michigan, maybe you're an alum. I know that there was somebody from the Rackham class of 83, uh, maybe you have a daughter, a son, uh, uh, maybe you work here. So you work at Michigan Medicine, that's great. Um, a friend got her master's here, uh, Michigan alum class of 70, uh, 78, School of Information, Stacy, nursing student, Michigan staff, father was an alum. This is really, really fantastic. So I encourage you to connect with each other through the courses, maybe in some of the follow-up materials. Uh, we're going to close down the chat for now. There's going to be opportunities to participate uh, in a little bit, but it's been really heartening to hear uh, the connections and the global reach of this. So. We have born in Michigan and in-laws, our UN alum. I can imagine that being a good place to ease some questions uh, between in-laws when you can put on uh, the Michigan fight song and, and reconcile your differences. So we're gonna get into today's presentation and we're actually gonna start with someone who has a connection to the University of Michigan. So this is Donald Hall and he's gonna help us introduce our idea of the discipline of break. So, Donald Hall is this wonderful poet. He was the United States Poet Laureate from 2006 to 2007. And he also taught here at Michigan for close to about 20 years. And Isha, maybe you can help me talk through this because we talked about this in class. Donald Hall has some interesting advice about taking breaks when writing. So you want to read a little bit about his advice and then we'll try to talk through it, Isha. The most important thing I've learned about writing is never write too much at a time. Leave a little for the next day. Yeah, so this is kind of counterintuitive, right? Like oftentimes we think, look, if I'm in a flow, I just want to keep going. It's so hard to start writing. Why would I ever want to stop when I'm in the middle of a good sentence, a good paragraph, a good chapter? Uh, explain, though, why he says, you know what? I'm worried if you write too much. Why should you always leave a little for the next day, Isha? I think he's talking about burnout or overextending yourself and then you end up having writer's block as opposed to leaving on kind of quitting while you're ahead and leaving when you're like very stimulated and motivated to write. Yeah, and so one of the questions that was submitted by, before the event started was how do I get that motivation after I've taken a break to start the next day? And this might be the start of an answer, right? If you're excited to pick up on where you left off, you're more likely to start. Oftentimes we have this sense of, oh, I just need to get to this end of this paragraph and then I'm at a good stopping point. The problem though, Isha, is explain this a little bit. How might it actually be easier to start if you catch yourself sort of like halfway through a sentence or even halfway through a thought, Isha? You know what you wanna write and you can go think and ruminate on that and then you're like excited to start again as opposed to like I've done everything I can and that keeps you less motivated from starting again. Yeah, you're not staring at that blank page. You're actually started staring at a half written page and there's a much better momentum, a much stronger momentum that could pull you along. So Alex, we'll go back to you or bring you in in terms of a follow-up thought from Donald Paul. You wanna read this for us, Alex? Sure. When you're still going good and you come to an interesting place and you know what's going to happen next, that's the time to stop. Yeah. So it's not even you should stop halfway through. It's when you're kind of peaking almost, or at least in a good spot. Uh, talk me through how this is a common bit of advice I give to people who are in your position once, which is finishing a dissertation. So explain what a dissertation is and why we need to build momentum for a dissertation, Alex? Um, a dissertation is basically an early iteration of a book manuscript that like three people will ever read, <laughs> but it's um, incredibly long. And uh, at least in the field of humanities, there's often like a literature review at the beginning and then your substantive chapters and then a conclusion, but it takes many years to write. And it's really hard to build up the motivation to keep going day after day, right? You can't cram a dissertation. So why might we, at least take a shot at this advice, at least take a shot at trying out. Uh, when you're going good, that's when you should stop in uh, your chapter writing, your, your sentence writing. Uh, explain that a little bit. Why not just stop in the middle, but stop at a place where things are going really, really well. 
Yeah, so those moments are pretty few and far between when you're writing a dissertation. So um, when you have those moments and if you can find a way to prolong them, that's really helpful. So in this case, um, if you're in the middle of a really like juicy thought or something you can really like latch onto, it, you wanna carry that through for as long as you can, but also like you wanna digest a little bit more and see if you can come up with more. Um, so like Isha said, you're gonna take that home with you, you're gonna think about it, you're gonna ruminate, and then you're gonna come back with perhaps even more um, material. Yeah, and I'll put in the chat a, a term for that, which is interleaving, right? This sense of taking a break from one thing, going to do another thing, and then coming back to that first thing. And what Alex has pointed out is that there's some really beneficial thinking that goes in between those two spots. So you can think about it in interleaving. Sometimes we talk about this in terms of spacing. Interleaving is when you're going between two different tasks. Spacing is just space between one single task. But we're thinking that maybe this is something to try out. And a good endorsement for this technique is actually two people. Uh, one of them is Gabri Gabriela Garcia Marquez, the Colombian writer. And the other is the American writer, Ernest Hemingway. And so Hemingway's advice was, look, I stop mid-sentence. And Gabriel Garmia, Garcia Marquez says, look, this is the best advice I ever heard about writing. In 1981, he actually wrote a short essay in the New York Times. And Alex, you want to read a little bit about his endorsement of Hemingway's approach? I don't think that any more useful advice has ever been given about writing. I don't think that any more useful- Oh, advice, next sorry, sentence. Sorry. <laughs> it is no more and no less the absolute remedy for the most terrible specter of writers. And that most terrible specter is? The morning agony of facing the blank page. Yeah, right? And Isha, you flagged this before, this idea of writer's block, right? Like, so now we have a way to potentially start to address this. Now, it's not gonna be a panacea, it's not gonna cure every issue of writer's block, but it's at least something to think out and extends beyond just writing, right? So working with consultants, when they're putting together PowerPoint slides, uh, why issue, why might it not, why, why might it be a good idea not to come to the end of the slide deck and then take your break, but actually sort of mid-slide or mid-presentation while you're preparing, uh, be a good time to take a break, Isha? I think it refocuses your attention and it just gives you, like it, you get more focus when you take small breaks in between. Yeah, and a little later on, we'll give you a term for this to think about that reconcentration, but just to flag that other professions could benefit from this, right? When you're putting together your lessons plan, don't necessarily stop, right? When you've come to the end of the lesson, maybe stop midway through and then come back the next day. Emails is another place. So Alex, maybe you can help me talk through this. I was working with an alum of the law school um, a couple of weeks ago who had a big email to write, right? Like lawyers are essentially professional email uh, writers. And a lot of the temptation is, you know, once I can hit send, then I'll go take the shower. And then I'll take a break. Why might a better place to go when you're drafting an email, uh, once I have saved a draft, be a good place to take a break. Not when I hit the actual send button, but why might it be good to take that shower right after you've saved it in your draft folder, Alex? Yeah, so this is particularly true of legal work, but of course applies to pretty much any field, but um, attention to detail is gonna be like the buzzword that you hear constantly when you're in interviews and things like that. And tired eyes need a break before they can come back and really spot some things that, I mean, I. I avoid hitting the send button for as long as possible so I can proof it as much as I physically can. <laughs> yeah, right. And so tired eyes uh, aren't the best editors or proofreaders. Angry eyes are definitely not the best proofreader and uh, editor. So one of the things you can do if you don't want to do the draft, but you want to take advantage of that sort of pit in your stomach that happens when you hit the send button, uh, send an email to a dummy email address, right? I create dummy email addresses that I can send my first draft of an article to. I can send a chapter to. Alex, talk me through like the benefit of actually getting to hit send, but with low stakes. 
Um, I mean, probably avoid a panic attack for one, um, but also you've sort of gotten the first draft of writing, but also the first draft of sending kind of out of your system. Um, and then when you can view it from this dummy email address and essentially try your best to view it as like a neutral person or the person on the receiving end, um, you've kind of gone through the motions of all stages of this email. And so when you come back to it to really send it to its intended recipient, um, it's a little bit less nerve wracking. Yeah, and that's why in my class, uh, we have all sorts of, and those who've taken the Coursera, we have low stakes practice, right? That's when you hit the send to the dummy person, but you're taking advantage of the high stakes project, right? When you have a high stakes project, or even when you think you're going to send something and you actually hit send, there's a kind of energy that focuses you that can be really how powerful, right? There's good stress, there's bad stress. The idea that you wanna really impress someone could be a good form of stress, but here's a way to hedge your bets a little bit, right? You hit that send button to your boss, but the first draft goes to this dummy email address or a close confident in your organization. So these are little tricks to try when we're thinking about writing and we're creating, but I wanna to return to what we flagged before with Isha and this idea of attention restoration and how to reconcentrate. But first I wanna qualify, right? There are certain industries, there are certain professions where we don't wanna stop right in the middle of things. So uh, if you're a surgeon, right, like do not stop in the middle of surgery, like finish the C-section, then uh, regroup, reflect. Uh, if you're my Uber driver, right, like, or if I'm driving you to the airport, I'm not going to stop midway through and reevaluate, right? Like, so I wanna say there are limits to the discipline of breaks. We wanna think about where they're appropriate, but I think it can be really useful, particularly when we want to regain our attention, when we want to spark uh, moments of creativity, and when we want to sort of map out the structure of the project that we're working on. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how to break, take breaks and how to make the most use of them, both for productivity, but also our well-being. There was a nice question in the pre-submitted questions that asked, look, should breaks be only something that we do because it makes us more productive or should they be a good in themselves? And I think it's both, right? Like it can be really helpful to be productive and it's also a really wonderful thing just for a fuller life. And particularly, and this I'll just bring you on for this because we discussed it in class, uh, nature, right? If you take a break with nature, uh, there can be something wonderful about that. And you you hinted at this before, the term is attention restoration issue. Do you remember what attention restoration is? Yeah, so taking walks in nature, just taking that time to take breaks will actually help you refocus and reconcentrate. Um, and it's just good for your mental wellness. Yeah, and the research from this comes from two people here at the University of Michigan, uh, Rachel Kaplan and her husband of 61 years before he died in, I think, 2008, uh, Stephen Kaplan. And through a number of studies, both that they did and they've um, summarized in their various writings, they found, look, uh, when you go outside, there's a wonderful way of refocusing and sort of replenishing. And it even has an effect if you just take a look, looks at pictures of nature, right? If you can't go outside because you're in Ann Arbor right now and it's downpour, uh, even looking at pictures of nature has been shown to have beneficial health, health outcomes. So in hospitals, if patients are near windows, um, behavioral outcomes, the prisons, if people have outside time, uh, or even in um, schools, right? We build in time for trying to look outside or take walks outside, or at least we should. Uh, Alex, as a parent, uh, explain how just taking your kids for a little outside time can have an amazing calming effect on the whole household. Um, yeah, so both my kids are actually in a nature-based or nature play-based daycare. Um, and so if it's, unless it's under 10 degrees or over 90 degrees, they're outside basically the whole day. Um, and there's actually sort of na nature kindergartens all across Europe. Um, and there's just a lot of research done on cognitive development. And like, there's a lot of sensory input that kids get. And often when they're sort of bouncing off the walls inside, they need some kind of sensory input. And so when they can roll around in the grass or crunch leaves or jump on a swing set, um, that sort of releases that 
energy so you don't lose your mind. <laughs> and this is something I do with my own students. When we're editing stuff, I will break in class and I'll say, go outside, 15 minutes. Take the thing with you, go outside, 15 minutes. Uh, if you want to clear your head and do some editing out there, or if you just want to clear your head and not do some editing out there. So when you come back, you're going to see something that you didn't see before. So now we're thinking, look, when we take the break, as Donald Hall said, in the middle of our sentence or in the middle of our chapter, don't open up Twitter, don't open up Facebook, don't open up something that's going to sort of like hit your, uh, take your cortisol levels through the roof, uh, maybe take a walk out side. And so uh, it has, a, as Alex said, lots of research to suggest, and I'll include it in the resources that we send with follow-up materials, decreases stress, and actually interesting research out of Stanford that it increases creativity, particularly if there's a walk involved. And so what I want to do is crowdsource some ideas for attention restoration. In a moment, Trevor is going to open up the chat, and I'm going to ask you to do something that I think we can all benefit from. I'm going to ask you to write a place that's very local to you, that could be a good place for attention restoration. So if you're in Ann Arbor, maybe the ARB, this wonderful um, green space uh, near campus. Um, but I want it to be particular. So uh, Alex, I'll go back to you. What's the benefit of writing a particular way? We trust this all the time in our courses, the power of the particular. The people who've taken the Coursera class have seen this in the first course. Uh, what's the benefit of specificity when we're writing, Alex? Um, perhaps the subject you're writing about is really interesting to you in like a broad sense and you know everything about it, but oftentimes your audience is not the, special, or the specialist in that area or isn't interested in everything you have to say about it. And so in terms of capturing your reader's attention, um, honing in and making it digestible and easily understood and interesting, um, you can pack a lot of punch into something much smaller than something very verbose. Great, and I love that phrase, pack a, uh, a lot of punch, right? There's an efficiency to the power of the particular. I'm putting that in the chat now, right? There's just a way in which this little detail says a lot, but there's an also another reason, particularly for this exercise, and Isha, maybe you can help explain it. It involves the advice giving effect. Isha, do you remember when we talked about the advice giving effect in class and why um, when you are uh, doing your assignments for the class, you actually have to give advice to other people um, based on the concepts we've been learning about. Do you remember the benefit of the advice giving effect, Isha? Um, I think it just helps you come up with better ideas for yourself as well. It's yeah, right? Like, so what's kind of interesting is that the advice doesn't always help other people, but there's a really interesting research uh, out of a trio of psychologists at Wharton um, at the University of Pennsylvania who says, look, the people who benefit the most from the giving advice are the folks who are giving the advice because it's specific to them. So I want us to crowdsource ideas, but I also want you to be specific. So right now, Trevor's going to open up the chat and put down what do you think is a really specific local place? If it's in Saudi Arabia, maybe it's in your backyard. Give me some uh, examples. Belfast, Kevin Hill, and Country Park. Good. Boston Commons says Amia. Amia is a wonderful alum of the Law School. Burns Park, says Lara Thomas. Uh, the Golf Course, Biloxi Beach, good. Rapadian Hill, Valentino Park in Turin, Italy. I would love to be there right now. You Law Club to see squirrels, perfect, from Anya, who's an undergraduate here at um, Michigan. Barry Curtis Park, which I love given my last name. Uh, Huron River Walkway, Scott Arboretum, West Engineering Arch with the flowering pear trees. Wonderfully written, Amelia Berry. Some swimming in my pool. Yeah, I'm a big fan of figuring out attention restoration in a pool, sort of like Oliver Sacks, a great writer and neuroscientist. So you're seeing where we can go. This could be a sort of travel list for us all. And so we're gonna close down the chat now, but these are really, really wonderful ideas. And what I'm gonna give you a chance to do is think a little bit more, right? A personal note, I often in class have private space for writing and public space for writing. So we had a just nice uh, instance of public space where you're sharing stuff, but I also want you to be thinking in a private way. So you're not writing places like uh, the freeway, and traffic as attention restoration. You're thinking about a place that's sort of like a mental massage. And to help with this and to signal that we need to take breaks, particularly on Zoom, uh, Isha, Alex, uh, and I are all going to turn our cameras off for two minutes so that you all can write. And I'll give you a little 
shot of the ARB here at Michigan. We taught a course through something wonderful here at the law school called a mini seminar, which is an informal way for faculty and students to get together. And I got to teach this one called Poetry in Parts, where we read poetry in parts and talked about all sorts of advocacy uh, connections between those two things. So I'm gonna turn off my camera. Isha is gonna turn off her camera. Alex is actually gonna to have to go to uh, ADR class right now. So we'll give a thank you to her, but um, write down on a piece of paper, some place that you might go in the next week to do a bit of attention restoration. We'll come back at two minutes in about two minutes. Wonderful. So I hope you have at least a few ideas. I also encourage you, whenever you have this time to write down ideas, I try to come up with as many as possible. One of the things that we really embrace in the course is uh, two, or actually two things we practice. One is the idea of shitty first drafts, right? Uh, the, this comes from Anne Lamont. Uh, but the other is the sense, and it's related, is uh, it takes a little while, sort of like your first ideas are rarely your best ideas, but they lead to uh, potentially greater ideas through something called adjacent possible, right? It's like that idea next to the idea that you really want to go to. So the reason we have this time for private writing is so you take the pressure off having to share stuff and you can just start to get ideas out on the page. So we're going to be joined by uh, another law student now. Uh, Matt, if you want to say hello, Matt. Hey, everyone. Thanks Great. for so, letting Matt. me join a little bit late. <laughs> That's okay. We, we, we know you had class. Uh, so uh, Matt, we're, we just got finished talking about the discipline of breaks in terms of small chunks, right? And so you, when you took the feedback loops class last year, we talked about this sort of like um, taking breaks to maybe a 10 minute walk, uh, let your brain settle, reconfigure, get a fresh perspective. But I also want to talk about larger breaks, right? And so later on, you and I are going to return to this conversation about challenge and recovery. But to introduce it, I want to talk about something um, that comes from a wonderful Supreme Court justice. So Louis Brandeis is the, was the first 
Jewish justice on the Supreme Court. And he was also, the, what was it before, or before that, he was known as the people's lawyer because he took a lot of cases uh, pro bono in the public interest. Uh, Matt, can you explain what pro bono means? Pro bono means that uh, you are providing lawyer services for free. And it, well, so it, it's actually for the public good, right? Like, so you're not taking a salary for this, but explain sort of like, why is this built into a lawyer's practice? Why is this uh, something that every state bar association uh, really encourages its lawyers to do? What's the benefit of pro bono um, activities? I mean, I think there are a lot of benefits. Um, one is being more involved with your community. Uh, which I think is really important when, you know, part of the practice of being a lawyer is is engaging with the law, which obviously is structured society. And so if you, um, it's good to, I guess, just engage in that society. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. I think also something that I've been told and I think is true in terms of benefits of pro bono is that you get to, you um, just be like happier in, in, in practicing, like you are actually helping people. I think uh, that's always really good for mental health as to know that you are actually doing good. Um, and then also I feel like another good part about pro bono is that it allows you to engage in different practice areas as well. Um, because obvious, yeah. So I think that those are the three benefits that come to mind. Yeah, and those of you who remember uh, in the beginning, I flagged this term interleaving, right? Like you might have a project where you're working for your client, and then as Matt said, maybe stretch a little bit, uh, take something, uh, it takes part of your day for the pro bono work, and then come back for your paying clients. And research has suggested, at least in terms of studying, when you switch from one subject, go back to the other subject, or, and then go to another subject and then come back to the first subject, you learn a lot more permanently and a lot more deeply. And so one way to think about structuring your own writing day is potentially be working on multiple things at once, not at the same time, right? You're not having two different laptops, but one of the things that I often recommend is having something where you're drafting and then something where you're editing. Matt, talk me through the benefit of, or at least thinking about drafting and editing is two different cognitive approaches. Why is it good to switch between those two? Why would it be bad to, um, if we think to Alex of trying to write two dissertations at once, but it's okay to write a big project and then edit a small project now? Well, I think there's a couple benefits that come to mind. Um, one is that kind of like you just said, really is interleaving. And so if you're doing two different projects at the same time, or you're taking a break and doing one project after another, there might be ideas from that second project that will help you with the first project and vice versa. Um, and then another thing I think is that drafting, I feel like, and I, I, I wish I actually did this in practice, but it's really hard. Um, ideally, drafting is getting back to the shitty first draft that you're talking about. Um, it's a different mental space where hopefully you're able to just write. You're just able to write, write, write. And that's a different kind of mindset than editing, which is, okay, let's refine what's going on. And that's a little bit more exacting and you're a little bit you know, more thoughtful, I guess, in your editing process, hopefully. Um, and so if you're doing those two things at the same time though, it can get a little jumbled. Maybe you, know, you are too refined in your drafting that can lead to writer's block or not getting anything down on the page. Um, and then vice versa, if you're editing and not really being refined, you're kind of just taking, you know, let's just draft, draft, draft approach. Um, it won't, the, the final product after it being edited won't be maybe as refined. Good, right? So we wanna be thinking about both of these as sort of two different tasks. When we talk about, oh, I don't wanna to write today. Well, think about, well, what would get me excited? Coming up with a new idea, maybe I wanna draft, or I don't have the cognitive ability, I don't have the environment to come up with new ideas and draft, but I can edit. And I think if we separate out those two activities, maybe we can approach writing in a much 
more uh, productive, but also enjoyable way. And it seems like Brandeis was someone who figured this out, right? So even before coming to the Supreme Court, he was famous for this article, the right to privacy. If you ever heard the phrase, the, light, the right to be let alone, that's uh, Brandeis. Um, he's had amazing opinions in terms of huge cases, in terms of the First Amendment to check out, not only someone who's got an amazing sort of uh, legal acumen, but also a wonderful prose style. So if you're looking for legal writers to emulate, uh, you don't have to agree with his positions, but just uh, appreciate the way he composes his ideas. And he's been uh, uh, honored in uh, big ways, right? There's Brandeis University. Maybe we have people who are alums of that university or uh, Brandeis Law Schools. If you end your life and two schools are named after you, that's not a bad uh, set of years on this earth. But I want to highlight a letter he wrote to uh, a young lawyer about how he was so successful, or at least advice in the law. And Isha, we talked about this in class, so maybe you can read it. He's talking about the limits of how much he can produce in a year. So you want to read it for us, Isha? Yeah. I can do 12 months work in 11 months, but not in 12. Yeah, so explain what he means there. I can do entire year's worth in 11 months, but if you tell me I have to do it in 12 months, I'm not going to be able to do it. What does that mean? Yeah, I think just that there are diminishing returns when you force yourself to work longer, when you have the expectation of working longer and harder, um, that result in burnout, and it can be more productive when you spend less time working. Yeah, right? And so we try to institutionalize this in our class with the positive no. Uh, Isha, what is the positive no? This actually comes from a book by a negotiation expert at Harvard, William Urey. Uh, explain what a positive no is in uh, negotiations. What is a positive no for negotiations, Isha? So when you say no to one thing, you're saying yes to another. And so it's kind of like that opportunity cost. Yeah, right. You're reframing the no, which it can be often difficult to communicate, particularly to people that you want to impress or you just want to follow through with, right? Like people who depend on you. It's really hard to say no to folks. And so William Urey says, look, if you recast it as a yes to something else, that can be a helpful approach. And so what do we do in our class? What's the positive no assignment, Isha? We, if we don't take one day off of class, we essentially don't pass the class because we need to spend one day saying yes to something else and doing a positive no to the class, essentially. Yeah, right, you fail my class. It's a pass-fail class, and there's a really surefire way to fail my class. Show up every single session. You have to not come at least one day during the semester. Now, there's a second component to this, Isha. It's not just that you can flake, right? You can't just skip class. Uh, what do you have to do instead, Isha? You essentially say yes to something else that could be like restorative, that is like for your mental well-being, or that's just essentially like productive, things you've been behind on. Yeah, right. And so I got a nice email from a student who took the class a number of years ago. He's not a law student. He's actually a public health student. And he wrote this. I mean, edited that email a little bit just to condense it. But he wrote, look, your course syllabus told us that if we went to every class, we would fail. I hadn't heard from the student two, three years. He just sent me this note out of the blue. Uh, at some point, we would have to decide to miss a class in place of something else. It was the positive no. Today, I did just that. I was asked to join an advisory group. I was indeed honored and felt I can contribute, right? It's this idea of, it's not a like zero thing that you're giving up on. I hope my class is kind of valuable and fun, but I really want to say there's things more important than coming every single time. Uh, but doing so would have come at the expense of other things I enjoy, including much needed personal time. And why this, presentation is called the discipline of breaks is because that requires a real kind of discipline. This person was actually a musician and runner, and so they know about discipline. But Isha, explain how it's really hard, particularly someone like you and Matt and Alex, who are these extreme achievers and people who want to be and are often are really generous. How, why, is, why do we need to sort of enforce the discipline of the positive? No, why doesn't it come easy, Isha? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really hard for lawyers, especially we want to say yes to all the assignments, we want to be the best associates we can be. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not able to do everything at the best quality when we're burnt out. So I think that's the benefit of 
taking the time to be like, I would benefit from taking this other time to do personal things or be productive in a different way. Good, right? And so what he says is, it's a powerful lesson. I hope I never forget it. And what I often say to my students, like if there's one thing that you take away from all the classes that we have together, I hope it's the positive note because I think it can have such a powerful effect on so many aspects of your life. Uh, but let's talk and sort of unpack this a little bit. And Matt, will bring you back in in terms of two labels or two categories you and I have talked about both in the feedback loops class and then often um, in your time as a research assistant and that's challenge and recovery right that's the twin balance that we need and let's read a little bit about the importance of challenge and recovery from a wonderful book called between um, the time between the dog and the wolf by John Coates, who was uh, Goldman Sachs uh, sort of market analyst, or at least trader, involved in finance for a while, and then he made a switch to become a neuroscience researcher at the University of Cambridge. So Matt, can you read a little bit from um, John Coates's really great book? Challenge recovery, challenge recovery. That is what toughens us. Right, it's this balance of we want to push, but then we need to recover. We want to push, and then we want to recover. And what he highlights is oftentimes, particularly people who sign up to do webinars are fine. They're, they got the challenge part covered, right? Michigan law students have challenge part covered, but we need to understand our the real benefits and the costs of not having recovery. So keep going, Matt, on recovery. No matter how brief, our bodies take advantage of downtime to rest and repair and over time, these mini breaks can add up to a healthy body and brain. Keep going. Should we, should we be denied these downtimes, even brief ones, even when things are going well, our biology can become unbalanced, leading us into pathological and physical states and inappropriate behavior. And some categories that he looks at for appropriate behavior are in the workplace and certainly high stakes environments like financial trading. Uh, for law students, I think this leading us into pathological and physical states and inappropriate behavior uh, resonates particularly with uh, finals week, right? Like that's a time where your apartments become disgusting, your, your like appearance becomes disgusting, like you degenerate into essentially uh, uh, something that you wouldn't necessarily aspire to put on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, and so we talk about this idea of trying to figure out, well, how can we anticipate this? And we're going to talk about it in terms of when do we get those diminishing returns? So there's been some wonderful work on this by an uh, economist at Stanford. And one of the articles, which I'll share in the follow-up resources, was published in the Economic Journal. It was called The Productivity of Working Hours. So Isha, uh, you want to read, this is not from the economist, but just um, a summary of his research, and then we'll get to the actual paper. Um, read this for us. Just say blank when you see that blank. Research that attempts to quantify the relationship between hours worked and productivity found that employee output falls sharply after a blank hour work week and falls over a cliff after blank hours. And those of you who are uh, impressively listening to this in a second language, being English, falls off a cliff is essentially like just downward, right? Like catapult down um, off the, the productivity chart. It's almost like useless. So what I wanna do is see where people's estimates are for this first category. Trevor's gonna actually launch a poll and I want you to see where do you think, what hour uh, do we start to see a drop off? Is it 35 weeks? Is it 40 weeks? Is it 45 weeks? Is it 50 weeks? So there should be a poll up on the screen and uh, take a shot at where do you think that we start to see a big drop off? So you're gonna need to click an answer, hit submit, and then um, we'll give people a little bit of time to check this out. Just take a guess. And then Trevor, can you show the results of the poll? Good, so uh, a lot of people say around 35, um, then 40, then 45, 50, 55, 60. Uh, this may reflect the global audience, right? Like uh, European work hours are, or work week hours are, are much less than uh, the ones in the United States. The research shows that it was around 50, right? Around 50, we see this marked decline. And then after 55, huge decline. So much so, the 
summary of the research said that someone who puts in 70 hours produces nothing more with those extra 15 hours, right? This idea that if you're hitting 55 and then you hit 70, you're actually not getting any kind of gain and you're just losing a lot of life. Uh, related to this, a research on the effect outside of the workplace. So in a study of hospital staff nurses, shifts longer than 12 hours and working weeks longer than 40 hours were associated with significantly heightened probabilities of error that have raised questions about patient safety. Again, this is now from the piece in the economic journal. In another study, medical interns were significantly more likely to be involved in motor vehicle crashes if they had just worked extended shifts. Similar reports have been made about airline pilots, police officers, truck drivers, soldiers, right? Like I will not take a ride from a law student during finals week. Uh, and so we have this phrase sort of like, friends don't let friends drive drunk. We might also think about it as friends don't let friends drive overworked because we're going to have this cost. It, extends. I've seen research that people who work 50 to 60 hours see about a 10% bump in relationship issues. Uh, over that, like 60 or maybe even 55 to 60, like we start, we're starting to climb, it triples, right? Like think about the externalities of this kind of work. Uh, I want to qualify this, right? This research was done uh, about a wonderful data set of, I think, 1914, a group of munitions workers, but uh, more recent research by Morton Hansen, who teaches at Berkeley Business School and collected in this book called The Great at Work, uh, shows this graph, right? Hours of output, sort of like productivity on the vertical axis, and then weekly hours spent on the horizontal axis, you can notice the similar sort of result. Around 55 hours and 70 hours, it's doing the same amount of stuff. So we think if you're a leader and you're pushing your team to 70 hours, you're not really getting anything out of them uh, besides creating havoc on the roadways. And think about the, what you're giving up by making that push. And we have this real sense of spending time in the office, really billable hours, right? And we wanna reevaluate whether this is that useful or even useful at all, and certainly um, pushing it beyond that to say how harmful it could be. Uh, so here's the question, how do we, figure out when to stop, how to structure our class. And this fits back to what, or our calendar. And so Matt, jump in on this, because we were talking about challenge and recovery. And so one of the things you and I talked about is look, take a look at your calendar. And we actually had an assignment like this in class. And I said, I want you to identify all your challenge days, right? Those places where you're going to have to be on, but I also wanted you to identify your recovery day. So explain why we do that. Challenge recovery, Matt. So I think it's, it's a lot of what we have talked about already in terms of making sure that you build in breaks to make sure that you are actually being productive during your challenge days, quote unquote. Um, I think that the calendar exercise is actually a really good exercise. And I, I did it in class and I kind of want to restart it um, because it, it holds you accountable. You know, you say, okay, this is, I already kind of slated this, you know, I'm looking at this calendar this Saturday uh, as a recovery day, and I'm just going to stick to it. Um, yeah, right. And that's what we talk about the discipline, right? You need that on there because when Saturday comes, you know, there's going to be an email asking you to do something, but right? you need to have that sort of pre-commitment plan. And so maybe I hope uh, for some of you, there's more recovery than challenge at many parts of your life, but we really concerned when people show me their challenge recovery and there's one day of recovery, right? At least put in the middle of the month, at least try to be strategic about when it is, but that's a cause for concern. It's a similar with your hourly schedule, right? Like if you have challenge meeting, challenge meeting, challenge meeting, challenge meeting, challenge meeting, and then this tiny recovery period, like don't schedule me for five o'clock because I'm not gonna get your best self. And then think about who does get your best self during these hours. Maybe it's not the people who are the most important to you, right? Like those five, six, seven o'clock in that evening, uh, those are people who we spend the most time with and care the most about, and they're getting us sort of at our depleted self. So we wanna be really aware of this. As Matt said, it can be a helpful exercise. Think about this in terms of writing, right? Where are those challenge days in terms of your writing? Where are the, edit, where are the sort of recovery days, whether that's editing, whether that's reading. Think about your daily schedule. Where do you do your best writing? We have that animal farm principle in the course. These are all ways to think about structuring your day. But I also wanna think about how we structure presentations. So Isha, uh, remember in class, we talked about 
Lyndon Johnson, he had this issue with presentations and speaking. Uh, he talked really fast. And so what we said is, look, how could we help Lyndon Johnson? And actually, it's something that he himself did. Those of you who are taking the Good With Words speaking and presenting class will encounter this um, exercise. What did LBJ do when he had this big high stakes speech after the death of JFK? How did he, how did he have sort of like build in recovery periods to his speech? Yeah, he built in pauses by like writing in. I, I think he wrote to stop. Yeah, he wrote in, he wrote in pause. And then when that didn't work, he wrote pause, pause, right? Like it wasn't enough one pause and that might be something that might think about, right? I need more than just an R, I need a double R. I need an R squared, uh, big letters. I was giving, uh, talking about this with a bunch of wonderful surgeons and one come up, came up with the idea of in your speech, somewhere in the lines, put a turtle to slow down, right? And we can think about this with our writing, right? If every sentence is a challenge sentence for the reader, if it's really long, Maybe we need a recovery sentence. Maybe we need something short. Maybe we need something like a paragraph break. And so I want to think about this both at a macro level and a micro level. How are we thinking about challenge and recovery, right? Uh, poise, as we said, if you can build these into your speeches, poise can be planned. You can come across as much more calm, much more persuasive, much more charismatic if you plan these parts of recovery in your speech and then also in your weeks in your days, in your months. Uh, I'm worried if we have too much recovery, right? Like we don't want a speech that's all recovery and no uh, law student, if they come to me with all recovery, that doesn't really fit. And it's not actually something I encounter that much. I teach this year, I taught at Michigan, UCLA and Ch University of Chicago. These aren't places known for being very recovery. Actually, Chicago has a fun tagline. Trevor, maybe you want to open up the chat, see if anybody can fill this out. Chicago is known for where fun comes to, anybody in the chat know what this is? Yeah, die, where fun comes to die, that's the place. So I think we need to, uh, we're okay in terms of challenge in, in these places. What we really wanna work on is this idea of recovery, right? And so we want this mix of challenge and recovery. And so that's what I wanna give you with the end of this presentation, I wanna give you one, two minutes uh, to reflect a little bit, come up with a takeaway from um, what we've covered. Isha, Matt, Alex have done a great job in highlighting a bunch of concepts, but one of the things we don't build in enough time for in education and certainly in work environments is reflection. So take about a minute, uh, Isha, Matt, and I will take our turn our cameras off. And then when you're ready, put a takeaway into the chat. See if you can give something to somebody else who might not have picked up on that idea and certainly take advantage of this advice giving effect to reinforce it for yourself. Good, so you can follow Haiti, Martha in terms of putting them in. We have pauses, give the brain a chance to consolidate what's been learned, right? So that's good from Jack, both for you and for your audience. Uh, putting it on a calendar, keep you accountable, right? Discipline of breaks. Uh, we have to give ourselves mental massages. Wonderful, from Anya. Have something to draft and something to edit. That's something that I often, Everywhere I go, I have something to edit, right? I get five minutes, I'm not scrolling social media. I can edit something and improve a sentence. It also just reconnects me with an idea that I might want to think about a little bit more deeply, um, not in front of the computer. Don't procrastinate by editing, right? Good, stop mid-sentence you have something to look forward to to keep the momentum going, right? The key to success as a writer, actually like writing, right? Like if once I get students to actually enjoy putting sentence together, whether they're for a dissertation, a brief, or even um, an Instagram post, that's when I know that they're really hooked. We have used nature to repair from Bob. Elijah says, recover time before kids return home. So you can give them the best of you, right? Take a walk before you come in, or even uh, invite them to come along with you on that walk. Plan, and then I love that, force yourself to take recovery time. It is good to keep switching between tasks 
help in the interleaving. So these are really wonderful. I'm gonna stop my slides so that Trevor can put up information about the next presentation. I'll also put in the chat a set of follow-up resources, but thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, big round of applause for Matt and Isha and Alex uh, for helping us out and, and Trevor and Ahmed and Emily and the whole team for putting these things together. I know they take a lot of effort and I really appreciate everybody who made it happen. If you hang out a, a minute or two, I'll put in the chat the, the resources. And we'll, there'll also be an email um, coming if you, if you need to go jump to another meeting. Thank you so much, Professor Berry, Aisha, Alex, and Matt uh, for joining us today and sharing your wisdom. And to, your, to our participants from all over the world, thank you all for joining us. You can check uh, our upcoming MOVE topics and guests at online.umich.edu forward slash MOVE. For the latest course offerings, events, and conversations, uh, follow Michigan Online or our social media channels on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If this topic was interesting to you and you would like to learn more from Professor Barry, I encourage you to take part in some of the courses we have online, such as Good With Words series, Speakers and Presenting, and Good With Words series, Writing and Editing. Thank you again for joining and learning with us today. We hope you will join us for an upcoming MOVE event.